Matthew does such a great job, I'm going to change yeah, okay. it though to this one. Okay, then we, yeah, okay, we can put it in. Das vielleicht, wenn du mit der Graffiti, also für wenn, hier, anfang, ja, wenn okay. du anfängst, okay. äh, brauchen wir bloß einschalten und er soll praktisch dann dieses nehmen. Sehr gut. Äh, okay. für, einschalten machen wir dann, das Einfach ist das Mute. Hier auch? Aber das ja. ist schon an, oder? Äh, ja, drücken wir nochmal drauf, weil ich habe es schon eingeschaut, ob es passt. Ja, okay. Dann gehen beide. Hallo, hallo. Jetzt geht's. Ja? Okay, dann. Dann, dann schnalle ich mir das um, ja? Ja, das kannst du Okay, und dann hole ich schnell zwei Batterien, ja? Dankeschön, Claudia. Ja? Perfekt. Hallo. Hallo. Wie geht's? So. Oh, perfekt. Excellent. I have a lot of friends who look forward to that. Yeah? Yes. Last year they only saw it accidentally. And now they're already waiting for it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And many people told me, you were on Facebook. I was like, I was on Facebook? Yeah. Yes. No, actually, I remember I was on vacation. I was. In the middle of the, deep in the forest in Canada. Hi, <laughs> Rolof. Hello. I'm sorry? Exciting week, yeah, always. Always. A lot to organize. Not always. This week, a lot to oh, organize. Right. I found every nice. every year, there's a, a lot, lot of work. Details, right? Yeah, yeah. So, a lot of details. But. Yeah, well. But I've got a good feeling this year. Yeah. Did you tell him to be careful with this? Yeah. He speaks. No. Maybe it'd be good. Maybe you should tell him. I don't, yeah, I'm I mean, really yes. Because well, yeah. he speaks very fast. I know, right? extremely yeah. fast, yeah. For a student. Is this okay for us? Yes, 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 yeah, yeah. No, I think you should tell him that. He, he will probably forget, but at least at the beginning, you have to scare the student that they don't understand the first thing. Now he knows that he has less time than what he prepared. Yeah, exactly. So he's, like, <laughs> he's going to oh try to squeeze oh his two goodness. hours. Exactly. <laughs> Hallo, ich habe eine Frage. Ich, ich beginne mit dem Mikrofon dann was zu sagen. Ja. Also, lass mal testen, ob das laut genug ist, wenn das hier ist. Äh, ja, ähm, ich weiß aber nicht, ob es aber ja, können wir gerne machen. Soll ich mal was sagen? Ja, 
Hallo, hallo, hören Sie was? <lacht> ich kann es hier ein bisschen schwierig werden. Ich glaube, das, wenn wir dazu das herausgeben, können Sie es. Hallo, ja, hören Sie jetzt was? Sie, Sie hören das nicht nur da drinnen, oder? Also Weil ich höre das, wenn ich so drauf glaube, ähm, ja. ich höre eigentlich gar nichts. Hallo? Hallo? Hallo, hallo, hallo. Ja, das funktioniert auf jeden Fall. Okay. Dann lassen Sie das mal hier und hier. Wie funktioniert das? Und das ist ein Headset, was man so, also das ist ein Headset und kann ein Erlacken mit Das müssen Sie so. Kommt das hin? Äh, oder nicht, ich glaube, anders. Ja, genau so, das ist das. Ich glaube, der Kollege hat es ja rausgefunden. Ich bin auch hier, äh, noch hier ziemlich, ah, genau, so. Sind Sie zufrieden? Ja? Ja, so ist es wunderbar. Okay, und man hört es auch. Also ich kann es ja. wieder ausschalten, oder? Ja, ja. Am besten einfach auf...
now it should be on, right? Now, how about now? Now? Because I went up, I went up there. Now it's working. Can you hear it? I can. Is it definitely working? Yeah, it's working. Okay. Dear Professor Heath, dear students and colleagues, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this year's Wittgenstein Lectures, one of the intellectual highlights of our academic year. For philosophy and economics, p and &E, the Wittgenstein Lectures are what is the Wagner Music Festival to the city of Bayreuth. Although our ordinary lives as teachers and students only stop for a week and not for an entire month, we too get to listen to, to enjoy and to reflect upon the refinement, not of Wagnerian music, but of profound and practically important arguments of a leading philosopher working at the intersection of philosophy and economics. I am extremely pleased to welcome Professor Joseph Heath as this year's Wittgenstein professor. The subject of this year's Wittgenstein lectures, climate change and obligation, obligations for future generations, could neither be more topical nor be more significant, especially in times where short-term populism pushes to defeat scientific evidence and any tentative attempt in pursuit of collective rationality. Before we will hear more about climate change, however, let me emphasize, emphasize that Professor He's work and research on this topic is really just the tip of the iceberg of an enormously wide range of research, impressive in diversity and depth. Professor Heath has published extensively on political philosophy, business and economic ethics, action and decision theory, critical theory in the tradition of the Frankfurt School, Habermas and Enlightenment, thereby combining extremely differential subjects, both methodologically and thematically. Professor Heath's work has been groundbreaking in uniting these approaches in highlighting, and in highlighting their moral and political significance. Until this week, I suspect Professor Heath will have been known most frequently among our students, our p and &E students, for his seminal and original contributions to business ethics. Not least because in my own lecture, I draw heavily and enthusiastically upon his material. Indeed, his market failure approach to business ethics nullifies the common ad hoc reaction many people have to the subject itself, namely that business ethics represents an oxymoron, that is, a contradiction in terms. However, I must add that, in fact, without your work, I would have a much harder time finding sensible material to teach. In the words of one of our own P&E graduates, Hasko von Kriegstein, who was also advised by Professor Heath, Joseph Heath's market failure approach attempts to integrate, and I quote, business ethics into a the larger project of figuring out how to best organize economic activity in a given society. And this is something I take to be a genuine hallmark of Joseph Heath's work and something we can expect to witness in the week to come. I now turn to introducing Joseph Heath, the philosopher. Professor Heath earned his PhD in philosophy at Northwestern University in 1995. Since he held academic appointments at Erindale College University of Toronto, the University of Montreal, and again the University of Toronto, where he serves currently as a professor of philosophy at the Department of Philosophy as well as the School of Public Policy and Governance, and as a fellow of the Trudeau, Trudeau Foundation. No surprise, he's the author of a very extensive list of academic, but also of more popular publications. His academic books are Morality, Competition and the Firm, and Following the Rules, Practical Reasoning and Deontic Constraint, both with Oxford University Press, as well as Communicative Action and Rational Choice with MIT Press. Today's initial and public lecture is entitled The Failure of Traditional Environmental Philosophy, the coming lectures will deal with intergenerational cooperation, climate change and economic development, cost-benefit analysis and liberal neutrality, and justifying a positive social time preference. 
Before I will give the floor to Joseph, I would like to thank our support club, the P&E Förderverein, for generously sponsoring the, drink, the drinks reception, of course that's very important, after this lecture, and to remind our students that they have to have recorded their attendance in the lectures at least six times in order to successfully participate in the exam on Friday. You will find attendance lists going around in all lectures and colloquia. Without further ado, Joseph, I would like to welcome you again here at the University of Bayreuth. We very much look forward to your lectures. Our floor is yours for the next five days. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, I unmuted. Everyone can hear me? Yes, okay. Well, so thank you very much for both the introduction and the invitation. Um, believe it or not, I mean, to be, to be asked or to be invited, to, uh, to be given the opportunity to talk for eight hours about a topic that you're intensely interested in uh, is actually something of a guilty pleasure for me. Um, at dinner parties, I usually can't talk for more than five, ten minutes in a row uh, before it becomes socially awkward. Um, <laughs> And so it actually is an enormous, enormous pleasure and opportunity to be able to give these lectures. Um, so um, I, I will talk about what I'm going to say today, um, but also going to give a brief overview of what I'm going to do over the course of the, of the week. Um, and um, so I want to start, though, with... Uh, I started out calling it the, the, the failure of, of traditional environmental philosophy. Now I, I got more radical. Now it's just the failure of environmental philosophy. Um, so today's lecture is going to be a kind of destructive romp through uh, the traditional philosophical literature uh, in order to explain why I think it, it hasn't been that helpful. Um, but, but, you know, it hasn't been helpful to what? It hasn't been helpful to the policy debates about climate change. So I, I, it was mentioned, and you can see from my slides, that I teach in both the Department of Philosophy and the School of Public Policy and Governance. Um, and so I spend a certain amount of time worrying about policy. Uh, climate change in Canada is an extremely vexed issue of policy, and so there's an intense public debate. But also, we still haven't yet decided politically exactly what we're doing and where we're going. So there's a very significant policy debate about how the government should be responding legally to the problem of climate change. Um, and there are various occasions in this policy debate where um, the people who are primarily involved in the policy debate have explicitly appealed for help from moral philosophers. Uh, and the most striking example of this was after the Stern Review uh, on the economics of climate change was what came out in 2008 in the, in the UK, um, where there were certain issues where, where it was acknowledged by all, on all sides, including by the economists, that these were simply moral questions. And there was kind of a suggestion made, well, maybe you moral philosophers could help us out a little bit with these questions. Um, and what they, were meant with, what, what they were met with was a kind of resounding silence. That is that the um, moral philosophers... Um, simply didn't have anything to say that was particularly helpful to the policy debate. Right? So what we found is that there's a, a policy discussion going on over here, which involves a number of very complicated normative questions where people could use some guidance. Right? That is, it's not an entirely technocratic discussion among scientists, for example. There are clear normative issues within that policy debate. And then over here, we have the debate amongst environmental ethicists and amongst philosophers about the question. Uh, and the reason why I, I, I put them, you know, with this space between them is that there's been practically no productive communication between those two discussions. And the primary reason for this is that philosophers reject almost all of the structuring presuppositions of the policy debate. And so the, the positions they wind up recommending are so radical from a policy perspective that they simply can't be taken seriously. But similarly, if you take a kind of middle-of-the-road policy position, the, the philosophical view that you would wind up having to endorse to derive that middle-of-the-road policy conclusion is absolutely radical vis-a-vis -vis the philosophical discussion. So what I'm going to be doing uh, over the course of the week is I'm going to be taking... Uh, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sort of practical person, first and foremost. Um, and also because I'm living in a country where there, where there is this very intense policy discussion about what to do. So what I'm going to be defending uh, from a policy perspective is absolutely boring. Namely, I'm going to be defending a completely middle-of-the-road policy position. Namely, that there should be a carbon tax of around 50 US dollars per carbon ton. Mm -hmm. uh, so on the policy side, it's going to be extremely boring. But 
I'm going to show that the philosophical presuppositions that one needs to defend in order to get to that boring policy position involve rejecting pretty much every view that's out there in the philosophical literature. And so it's a philosophically radical stance that generates an, in fact, extremely plausible, I would like to argue, policy conclusion. Um, and it, so depending on the audience, people either get, think it's really obvious what I'm going to say or really outrageous. Um, so here's how the, the discussion is organized. Um, it's the following. So, uh, so I, I, I'm going to talk sort of backwards through this. I, I got involved in these debates or interested in them uh, because of the debate that arose after the Stern review about discounting. So those of you who followed it <coughs> will know that this rather technical issue arose uh, about the time discount rate that one should use in cost-benefit analysis. And I had already done some work on discounting. I already thought it was an independently interesting question. Uh, and so I, that was what sort of drew me into, the, into the, the discussion. And that's also because that was the specific point on which people were saying, oh, we could really use some help here from the philosophers. So I started with discounting, but I realized that when I would talk about discounting in philosophical circles, that nobody was even vaguely interested in talking about discounting, because discounting is an issue that only arises within the framework of cost-benefit analysis, and everybody rejected cost-benefit analysis. Right? So people just, philosophers consider themselves largely immune to the whole question about discounting because they're like, oh yeah, that's for those cost-benefit people and I'm not one of those people. So I realized, so I want to kind of working backwards, like sort of the, like the layers of an onion, right? So the middle, the core of it was this discounting issue. But around that was cost-benefit. So I realized the reason I was interested in the discounting issue was that I take, I take cost-benefit analysis seriously. But people reject cost-benefit analysis. Right? Um, so... Oh, well, let's start defending cost-benefit analysis. But then I began to realize that part of the reason that a lot of people rejected cost-benefit analysis, I mean, they had their other reasons, is that even more dramatically, uh, people even reject the characterization of climate change as a collective action problem. And so it turns out that sort of mainstream people in the philosophical literature claim that it's, that it's, that it's not even an externality or collective action problem. And so before you could defend the need for cost-benefit analysis, you need to defend the, the simple idea, which is kind of mainstream amongst economists, that climate change represents a kind of collective action problem. People thought the intergenerational structure of it made it that it couldn't be a collective action problem. All right, so then I wound up writing a paper trying to explain, no, 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 it really is a collective action problem, right? Then I realized that, well, the, the whole framework in the policy debate for thinking about how to address the collective action problem involves the presupposition, which is central to IPCC reports, that, that there's going to be an ongoing process of economic growth. And that a lot of the difficulty of the climate change problem involves the trade-offs involved between economic growth and development and then carbon abatement. Right? So the presupposition was that of a growing economy. But everybody rejects the whole idea that there's a growing economy or that economic growth is desirable in the first place. Right? And as a result, the, the trade-offs didn't strike people as being significant or real trade-offs. Um, okay, so then you have to defend economic growth. Well, then you, you encounter, I think, what, what is really sort of the bedrock issue which is that most environmental philosophers reject liberal neutrality, which is the premise under which economic growth even shows up as being a good thing. So people subscribe to some kind of critique of consumerism or a set of perfectionist values, which says that economic growth is of no value, and underlying that is a rejection of the basic presupposition of liberal neutrality. Well, I'll explain what that means, right? But th that was the sort of core issue. All right, so <clears throat> in order to have the discussion that I thought was important to have, you wind up having to explain and justify the broader presuppositions of the policy debate. Now, the people in the policy debate, I call them presuppositions, because the people doing the policy discussions presuppose them. These things aren't regarded as controversial amongst the people who are debating policy. But they are regarded as controversial for people who come at it from a philosophical perspective, particularly from people who come at it from a background in environmental ethics. So what I'm going to be doing over the course of the week is taking them in reverse order, is I'm going to go through and try to systematically justify these five presuppositions of the policy discussion, right, and to provide some kind of motivation for them. Now, another way of describing this is what I'm going to be defending is actually what's sometimes pejoratively called economism. Right? In other words, I'm going to be def defending a very sort of standard e economist perspective on the problem of climate change but I'm going to try to provide moral arguments in support of those positions. And I should mention as well that the, the, the normative framework I'm presupposing is not the economist's standard kind of welfare consequentialism. I'm going to be trying to show how a sort of generic uh, 
pre-Rawlsian kind of liberalism leads you to accept these presuppositions. Right? In other words, to show that it's not controversial, that there are good reasons to accept these basic uh, presuppositions. So like I said, so um, philosophically controversial, but, but ultimately not controversial in terms of its policy recommendations. Um, okay, so, le so let me, right, so that's what the week's going to look like. Um, and so today, the thing I'm going to bite off and chew is this point about liberal neutrality. So I want to explain why it is that people have, rec have rejected it, what it is, and then why accepting a, a neutral framework leads you to have a certain kind of perspective on the climate change issue. Um, so to start at the beginning then, <clears throat> let's start with environmental ethics. Uh, one of the things that's very noticeable uh, to people who, who teach it um, is that there is something of a disconnect in the literature bet between what I would think of or as the sort of tradition of environmental ethics, which, we, which began in the 1960s, which we typically teach in our introduction to environmental ethics course, and then I teach the next year course, so they, in the, instead of the second year environmental ethics course, I teach the third year topics in environmental ethics, and I teach a course on climate change. And one of the things that is really noticeable about my course is that even though it has the second year environmental ethics as a prerequisite, what I teach has absolutely nothing to do with what people study in the introduction to environmental ethics. In other words, there's, I mean, we have it as a prerequisite, but it's not needed whatsoever. Um, because everything that gets taught in introductory environmental ethics, I wind up completely ignoring when I go on to talk about climate change. Now, that's also something you'll notice if you look at the philosophical literature on climate change. So if you look at the work being done by Simon Caney, Stephen Gardner, John Broom, Lucas Meyer, people like that, there's no reference or citation to the 40, 50-year tradition of environmental ethics. They completely ignore it. Right? So, like, so why are they ignoring it? It's because the people uh, that, that I just mentioned are all liberals, and they're presupposing a framework of liberalism. And environmental ethics is fundamentally not a liberal view. Uh, what happened in environmental ethics is it wound up getting sidetracked into a debate about the metaphysics of value that wound up being a really interesting philosophical discussion, but it wound up sort of paralyzing environmental ethics when it comes then to addressing policy questions. So there's some irony in this fact, given that environmental ethics arose, as I mentioned, in the 1960s, as part of a broader movement in philosophy of philosophers trying to prove it, the value of the discipline for everyday life. So there was a whole bunch of fields of applied ethics that arose at around the same time in the 1960s. Business ethics, bioethics, environmental ethics, right? They're all part of this general movement to kind of prove the value of philosophy in everyday life. Um, so there's, a little bit, there's some irony in this, in that a lot of these fields of, of applied ethics actually wound up not <laughs> proving their worth in everyday life. Why? Because they got sidetracked into a number of very esoteric philosophical debates. So that's definitely what happened with environmental ethics. <clears throat> um, so I'll talk a little bit about then um, the, the metaphysics of value and the way in which people in environmental ethics got um, sort of preoccupied by it. Um, if you open up a, a, an introductory textbook in environmental ethics, uh, almost invariably, the first question that gets addressed has to do with the nature of value or of goodness. And in particular, this debate about anthropocentric versus non-anthropocentric theories of value. And one of, the, one of the ways in which that's reflected is the fact that environmental ethics textbooks often actually start out with a discussion of animal rights. So, for example, Peter Singer's article, what's it called? On the rights of animals? Um, I mean, it's, like this, it's a chapter from his animal liberation, right? So Peter Singer's article on animal rights often shows up as the introductory chapter in a book on environmental ethics. And people just take that for granted. But you might think about that and think it's strange. Like, so if we're interested in the environment, why are, why are we talking about animal rights? Superficially, at least, animal rights have nothing to do with, with the environment, right? Like, it's not an environmental question whether or not you're mean to your chickens or, or you're not mean to your chickens, right? right? So why is it that we're talking about animal rights? It's because of the way environmental ethicists framed their problem. And the way they framed it had to do with the nature of, of moral value. And what they found interesting and attractive, compelling, 
about animal rights is the way animal rights tries to push the scope of value beyond merely human considerations. In other words, they saw it as the, the first step in the development of a non-anthropocentric system of value. So Peter Singer develops a critique of anthropocentric value, right? and that's what strikes people as interesting about it. Um, now, as soon as they, they did that, however, um, this, other this other distinction gets introduced, almost invariably, um, which intersects in sort of a confusing way with the distinction between anthropocentric and non-anthropocentric value. And this is the distinction between instrumental and intrinsic value. And the thought is that uh, anthropocentrism says that only human welfare has intrinsic value. And therefore, anything other than human welfare must have only instrumental value. It must be valuable only as a means to the production of human happiness, which is the only type of intrinsic value. Right, so even when I said that, like, oh yeah, that sounds plausible. Like, did that sound plausible when I just said that? Hopefully that sounded plausible. I mean, it's not, but I, it, I think it sounds plausible when you first say it. So um, this led people to think that the way to defeat anthropocentrism was to demonstrate the existence of non-instrumental value in nature. In other words, if you could show that something other than just human happiness has intrinsic value, you would have sort of dealt a blow to the view that only human welfare counts and that therefore that morality is all about people. And so the, the sort of natural strategy of argumentation is to try to establish the existence of intrinsic values in nature. That was then taken to defeat anthropocentrism. So there's a couple arguments um, that, that purport to do that, um, but the most famous of these arguments is what's called the, the last man argument. Um, and it, it's, it's from Richard Sylvan, and this is roughly how it goes. Um, so suppose, it doesn't have to be man, right, but it was because it was in the 70s. Um, so the thought experiment is the following. Suppose that the human race uh, loses its ability to reproduce, this is like the children of men type, type scenario, right? And so humans slowly go extinct. And um, you then wind up, as for some reason, being the last person alive. And so after you, like, that's it for humanity. Um, the question is, uh, what if, like, okay, so it's your last day on Earth, and everything around you, it's all, you know, emptiness and whatever. So the, the question is, what if you were to go on like a rampage on that last day? Uh, like, for example, a killing spree. So you were to go out in the forest and like start a forest fire. And then, you know, as the animals are fleeing from the forest fire, you know, shoot them uh, or whatever. Just go crazy uh, and destroy as much of nature as you can uh, on, the, on the last day uh, of, that you're alive. Uh, would it be morally permissible for you to do this? And what Sylvan says is, uh, no, it would, be, it would be wrong for you to go on a rampage and destroy all of this natural beauty, whatever. Um, so what this shows is that, okay, so if it's wrong, that's because there's some kind of goodness that's being destroyed by your actions. But it can't be instrumental goodness because by, by construction, there are no other people who are going to benefit from any of this stuff, right? You're the last person. And so there must be some kind of intrinsic value in nature that says that even though humans are about to go extinct, we should still leave things in place for, other, I don't know, for, what, uh, for itself, right? All right. So this is how the last man argument goes. Um, the conclusion then that people drew from this was that anthropocentrism is false as a theory of morality because there's intrinsic value in nature. And so we've shown now that morality is not just about humans, and here it gets slippery. It's not just about human interests. It's not just about human values. Rather, it's about goodness that also inheres in nature. Um, now, and by the way, so I say it gets slippery because it, it does get really slippery. Because one of the things you find then in the literature of environmental ethics is serious confusion or slippage in the definition of exactly what anthropocentrism means. So here's an example of it from Eric Katz, although like, there's lots of examples of this in the literature. Um, so he defines anthropocentrism as the idea that human interests, human goods, and or human values are the focal point of any moral evaluation of environmental policy, 
and the idea that these human interests, goods, and values are the basis of any justification of environmental ethic. Right? So that's a typical kind of definition you get of anthropocentrism. Notice, however, the way human interests get run together with human values in that argument. Right? So clearly the last man argument establishes that there's value in nature which is not dependent upon human interests. Because by construction, there are no further human interests, right? But does that show that there's value in nature which is independent of human valuation? That, it seems, would require a very different argument. Right? Just showing that it's independent of human interests does not show that it's independent of human values. And so this was pointed out by various people, including David Schmitz, um, with a variation on the last man argument. So instead of being like the last man in the forest, imagine the last man at the museum. Okay? So imagine exactly the same scenario. You're the last person alive. And rather than going on a rampage in the forest and lighting fires, suppose you go to the Louvre, right? And you decide to go on like an art rampage, you know, because it'd be really fun to push over Michelangelo's David and the, uh, the winged victory of Thrace or whatever and to like ca carve up the Mona Lisa and the raft of the Medusa. I've always hated that painting. I'm going to spray paint it. All right. So you go on a rampage through the Louvre and you destroy all of this art, right? Have you acted wrongly? And I think a lot of people would also say, yes, you've acted, you've acted wrongly, uh, that the rampage in the museum is just as bad as the rampage uh, in the forest. It's a kind of wanton destruction of beauty and so forth, right? Okay, so what that shows is that there's intrinsic value in the museum, just like there's intrinsic value in the forest. And that value, so it's intrinsic value because it's independent of human interests. But is it independent of human valuation? That seems extremely dubious. Why? Because all of this art, it's just human stuff, right? Humans made it. Uh, only humans respond to its aesthetic properties. It seems to be clearly still working within the sphere of human valuation. So the last man argument, I think what the museum version of it shows, is that just showing intrinsic value doesn't really get you outside of the circle of human values, right? It only makes that point about interest. Right? So the difference between interest and values winds up being really significant. Um, so, like, so there can be a lot of, of theories that are anthropocentric from the standpoint of valuation, uh, even though they ascribe uh, more than just instrumental value to nature. So in many ways, what happened, I think, what I, what I, what I think really happened here is that a lot of environmental ethicists were far too influenced by Peter Singer. Uh, because the way Peter Singer set up the problem... So, in other words, the, the way I mapped out those distinctions, anthropocentric, non-anthropocentric, intrinsic value, instrumental value, those map onto its, each other perfectly if you think of morality as a kind of like 19th century utilitarianism. Right? So if you're like a 19th century utilitarian, you're going to say the only thing that has value is human happiness. Right? That has intrinsic value. Uh, and then the only, everything else can have value only if it promotes human happiness. What makes us happy is when our interests are satisfied. Therefore, the only other kinds of value are things that satisfy human interests. Therefore, there can be human happiness that has intrinsic value, and there could be everything else that has instrumental value, right? And that's all that there is. Right? So, the, so this analysis is, an, uh, is reasonable as a characterization and a critique of 19th century utilitarianism. But there are a lot of other normative ethical theories to which it simply doesn't apply, where you can have like cross-cutting uh, versions of the two. So think of like a, I mean, a Humean theory of value that just says, you know, the world is whatever. It doesn't have intrinsic values. Like, sorry, it doesn't have values on sich, right? Like they're not built into the world. Rather, value is a response-dependent property. I experience the world, and it generates a certain kind of response in me that causes me to value things. But I might value things in different ways. Right? So if, if I see a, a wolf eating a caribou, I might say, oh my God, that's horrible. Right? But not because it's horrible for me. It's not because I wanted to eat the caribou that, that I, I'm upset, right? It's because, oh my God, it's bad for the caribou, right? So, that, and that's, so clearly it's response dependent. It's, it's not like in nature, it's in me, the response. And yet the value that I'm ascribing to nature is not an instrumental value. 
So as soon as you get out of this utilitarian way of, of thinking, it, you know, it becomes, I think, fairly obvious that you could have intrinsic values in nature and still have a completely anthropocentric system of value. Okay, um, and fi fi I guess the other thing I want to say then is that the fact that the theory of value remains anthropocentric actually is quite an obvious feature of uh, Peter Singer's arguments. Right? In other words, Peter Singer's arguments for animal rights clearly do not establish a non-anthropocentric system of value. Why? Because all they're doing is extending the scope of human values. So, so Singer's style of argument is referred to now as uh, moral extensionism, right? Or expanding the circle, right? So Singer wrote a book called Expanding the Circle. And that's always like the picture for Peter Singer, is that you, and how the animal rights picture works, is you start with the circle, which is like humans and stuff humans care about. And then he says, well, you know, all Peter Singer's arguments have the same structure. They say, oh, look at X, right? X has a certain moral property. I, oh, but look at Y. It's not all that different from X. Therefore, we must expand the circle and apply the same moral property to like X and Y, right? So that's the basic expansionist move. Um, now, what, like, what is the circle? The circle is human valuation, right? Human values. Right? So he's not transcending the sphere of human valuation. All he's doing is taking it from a set of canonical cases, oh, this is how you have to treat people, and extending it to a set of non-canonical cases, saying, oh, this is how you have to treat animals. Right? So here's your classic thing. So you've got your moral domain, you've got what you, what you think of as a bunch of non-moral subjects, and then Peter Singer says, oh, ta-da, we expand the circle. Um, now, that's not going to get you outside of, of anthropocentrism. In fact, that's presupposing anthropocentrism. Um, okay, so this is actually the argument that, it, that it has become... This, so this style of argument is actually the, the, been the central argument in environmental ethics. Um, and I think you can see the confusion in the fact that people have been relying upon this argument, even though the argument itself is clearly not really getting you beyond the sphere of human values. Um, so here's how the argument works, and I have to say that this argument has created a fair bit of, of mischief as well. Um, because, well, for the following reason. The thing about moral extensionism is that once you start extending, right, or once you start expanding the circle, it's actually really difficult to stop. Um, and so... When environmental ethicists start out the textbook with Peter Singer's animal rights argument, it's not because they intend to stop there, right? Because then you would never get to environmental ethics if you just stopped with animal rights, right? So they take Singer as a first step, as a way of kind of breaking us out of the prison of the mind that we're held in. But the thought is that once we've taken that first step of expanding the circle, then we'll be more receptive to expanding the circle beyond the sphere of mere sentience or what have you. And I should mention that there are, there are two kind of versions of the Peter Singer argument, right? So the, the, the better version of Peter Singer's argument is um, we have a domain X that has some moral property P. Y is exactly like X in all morally relevant respects. Therefore, P must be applied to Y as well. Right? That's the good version of the argument. The, the bad version of the argument, or the more dubious version of the argument, is what's called the argument for marginal cases. And the way it goes is you start up by saying X has moral property P. There is no way of drawing a principled distinction between X and Y. Therefore, P must be applied to both X and Y. Right? So that's this kind of blurry area, like, you can't just stop with X because, and then you point to these marginal cases, and then you say, therefore, you must expand to just Y. Okay? And so, uh, the pro that, and the problem with the argument from marginal cases is that it's, it's basically a disguised form of skepticism. Once you get going with it, it's actually impossible to stop. And this is something that animal rights people, actually, I think, are not sufficiently attentive to. So animal rights people will often make the argument 
for extensionism to animals by pointing to marginal cases of humans. So they'll say, well, what about children or what about the disabled and so on, right? So if, you, if, if someone wants to say, oh, you know, uh, rational autonomy is the basis of morality, and if you don't have rational autonomy, you're not a moral subject. And people say, oh, really? Well, you know, what about, you know, old people who are demented? They don't have rational autonomy. Can we just do whatever we want? You know, or what about the disabled and so on, right? So that's the argument for marginal cases. And so people often triumphantly say, ha-ha, now that shows that we extend it all the way to animals, right? But then, of course, well, now you've expanded the circle, but to what, right? So your new line is going to have a bunch of more problems, right? So then you, you say, well, it's actually sentience is what we care about. It's the ability to have interests, right? So my fellow Canadian, Will Kimlicka, has this view, right? So it's about having interests, right? Well, okay, where do interests stop? You know, so we want to say, okay, well, your pet dog has interests, I guess, sure, whatever. Um, you know, how about, a, how about a lobster, right? Um, how about a sea cucumber, right? So then you start looking at these, they're the animals, right? But they don't have like a central, I mean, you know, they, so, you know, nature comes in, it's like the great chain of being, right? There's a lot of gradations of being. So you can point to these marginal cases. And then people say, well, you know, what about plants, right? C contemplate the majestic redwood cedar, right? Does it not have interests? Right? Um, does it not strive towards the sunlight and so forth, right? Um, and so whatever definition you have for privileging animals, then it looks like you can start extending it. So that's, of course, exactly what environmental ethicists have done. They said, look at the cases of what... So exactly the same game that animal rights people have played with humanists, say, environmental ethicists have played with the animal rights argument. So they said, you can't stop with just animals. You have to extend it to include plants. Uh, and any kind of principled distinction is not going to be viable. Um, so what happens is you, you move from speciesism, like that's your Kantians and utilitarians, right, to then sentientism, which is the standard animal, animal welfare, animal rights perspective. Um, but then that gets extended to biocentrism, whereby it's not just sentient life forms, but it's all life forms. Well, then, you know, you can play the same game again. And you can say, well, you know, that tree is not really viable all by itself. That tree is part of a complex ecosystem, and it may have interests, but it only is viable and can survive as part of a broader system. You have to have this bigger picture of ecosystems, right? And an ecosystem is going to include the soil, it's going to include water. In other words, it's going to include things that are not alive. And so the same way that the speciesist arbitrarily privileges the human, and the sentientist arbitrarily privileges animal consciousness, right? the biocentrist arbitrarily privileges life forms. Right? But the ecocentric perspective then extends it beyond life to include ecosystems in general. So Aldo Leopold's famous instruction to think like a mountain right, is an instruction in part to think of in terms of broader ecosystems, not just in terms of living things. Right? Um, now, you see where this is going, right? Uh, and so the literature gets, I mean, weirder and weirder um, as people move towards these broader and broader conceptions of where value lies in nature. And so I stopped at ecocentrism because beyond that, I treat it as a reductio. But there's two more steps on the road. So the next is like an Earth system or Gaia ethics, which, by the way, before climate change, people were really big on Gaia. But the whole idea of Gaia, of the Earth as a self-regulating, healing system, is totally off-message when it comes to climate change, right? Um, like, because the Gaia thing suggests that you shouldn't care at all about climate change, because the wisdom of the Earth will heal itself, blah, blah, blah. Like, I'm actually surprised that climate denialists and American Republicans haven't, like, glommed onto Gaia theory as, as a perfect justification for doing nothing about climate change. Because the whole Gaia thing was about the self-healing properties and we, as tiny humans, can't understand the majesty, uh, blah, 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 right? Um, so when I was young, it was all like Gaia all the time. And now there's been a suspicious decline of interest in Gaia. Uh, why? Because, you know, because it doesn't look like the Earth is just going to heal itself. Okay. Um, but then you say, well, why stop there? Uh, and so you get like an entropy ethics, uh, where people wind up kind of having a generalized worship of orderliness in nature, that goes beyond just the earth, and so like, you literally get like an entropy ethics. Um, no, the opposite, negentropy ethics. Um, 
So this stuff gets into like and cosmic purpose ethics and blah, blah, blah. So this to me is a reductio of the conceptual strategy, right? Um, but what I think what it shows is that the argument is actually a kind of general skepticism that's being kind of misdeployed, right? That is, the, the, and particularly the argument for marginal cases. It's not really a philosophical argument. What I mean by a, a, a skeptical argument is that it's actually an argument that undermines any attempt at drawing a boundary. Uh, and so it's been deployed selectively to attack the boundaries that some people draw with the assumption that your boundaries are somehow exempt from it. Right? But what I think you can look at the literature, you can see it actually undermines like anybody's boundary. So what it means is that no matter where you draw the boundary of moral considerability or what have you, there's going to be something kind of arbitrary about that point where the boundary is drawn. And then, of course, if it's going to be arbitrary, well, then you can draw it back at the beginning at the species boundary or, or whatever. Right? Um, all right, so, so that's like where the, the, the Singer argument, which is, as I say, uh, obviously anthropocentric, has kind of gen, gen, generated this proliferation of different accounts of where value lies in nature. Um, that I think that the, 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 the general direction of is a kind of reductio ad absurdum of the whole conceptual strategy. Uh, and nobody has come up with a really powerful and compelling argument for why it has to stop, like, here, right? There are lots of good arguments as to why everyone else's boundary is not a good place to draw the boundary. Um, but no really good, like, ta-da, yes, that's where the boundary has to be. Again, which, again which feeds my diagnosis that says it's basically a kind of skepticism. So then what's the alternative to this? So the alternative to moral extensionism, uh, to coin a term, is what I would call moral saltationism, which is that instead of extending the circle, maybe we should make like a leap to some other perspective. Um, so that we really, instead of just taking human moral properties and stuff that we care about, we should really try to think outside the box and look at things from the perspective of other life forms. And so, you know, we have like human values, and then, but we have to adopt the perspective of the wolf and think about the wolf's values. And you have to adopt the perspective of the tree and think about the tree's values. All right, so this is, again, this is a recommendation that's often found in the literature um, that would, you know, so you have to go, go non-anthropocentric. It means that you really have to take these different perspectives seriously. So when I'm watching the wolf eat the caribou, and I say, oh my God, that's so cruel. You know, he eats it alive. Like, it's so mean. Like, um, that's like just really human. I'm just being kind of a sentimental human. So I have to look at it from the wolf's perspective. <clears throat> Or maybe I have to look at it from the caribou's perspective, or maybe I have, who knows what perspective, but I have to look at it from a different perspective than just my parochial human perspective. Um, so I guess here's, you know, there's the alternative. Now, um, <clears throat> how, is this, how is this helpful? Um, it doesn't seem particularly helpful. Uh, it, it seems to actually just generate uh, another form of skepticism because you have all these different perspectives, and then the question is, uh, like what, what perspective are you supposed to adopt when it comes to then making a decision, right, if this is your view? Um, so Tim Hayward has an article on this that I thought was very helpful, where he says, so what, I'm calling it moral saltationism as a, just to have a title for the strategy, which is don't expand the circle, posit new circles. So he says, in the abstract, one could, of course, declare that some feature of the non-human world was morally valuable, despite meeting no determinate criteria of value already recognized by human. But because the new value is completely unrelated to any existing value, it will remain radically indeterminate as a guide to action. Right? So I think that's the crucial point, which is <clears throat> what, when you have to then do something, what perspective are you supposed to adopt in order to do something? Um, so, you know, in, in the kind of weirder corners of the internet, um, I mean, I get, first of all, the internet doesn't have corners, and secondly, they're all weird, but anyhow. Um, in the weirder corners of the internet, you can find um, 
really hardcore uh, animal welfare people who want to create a cruelty-free nature. Right? So they're actually appalled by the amount of, I mean, there is a lot of cruelty in nature. It's not just humans that inflict cruelty on animals. Um, and so they want to intervene in nature. They think it's our moral imperative, especially if you're consequentialist, right? Because if you're a consequentialist, well, pain is bad. It doesn't matter who creates the pain. So if the wolf creates the pain, that's just as bad as if you create the pain. And your obligation to relieve pain is the same, regardless of whether it's a wolf or you which is doing it. So part of the agenda then for a cruelty-free nature is actually either genetically engineering carnivore, re-engineering carnivores uh, so that they are vegetarian, um, or else eliminating them. And um, so there's actually, and one particular lightning rod of dispute uh, is about what to say about domestic cats. Um, because domestic cats, um, uh, well, I don't know, maybe you've, any of you tried this, but they really don't go for a vegan diet. Um, that is, they are resolute carnivores, um, but they also kind of kill recreationally. And um, so are responsible for, for literally billions of bird deaths per year. Uh, and I have, in the written version, statistics on this in North America. Like people, uh, where I come from, people complain about windmills killing birds. Um, like one cat kills more birds per year than the biggest wind turbine you've ever seen. Um, and uh, domestic cats are actually responsible for at least 33 species extinctions uh, that we're familiar with. Because um, unlike dogs, they actually catch things <laughs> when they go hunting. <clears throat> um, so, you know, whose perspective are you supposed to adopt on this thing? So you have carnivores who are out there creating all kinds of suffering. Should you look at it from the human perspective or from the carnivore's perspective? From the human perspective, the suffering's bad. From the carnivore's perspective, it's not bad, right? Now, I should mention, um, so some of the big environmental ethicists, like Leopold and like Baird Collicott, were like um, morally opposed to vegetarianism uh, and avid hunters. Uh, partly because they're into ecosystem stability, right? And so they don't see hunting as a problem. It, it contributes, uh, we're the top predator. We've, for, you know, for hundreds of thousands of years, we've been part of various ecosystems as hunters. And so humans should continue to hunt, right? Uh, simply because that's our natural role in many ecosystems. So you get lots of conflict over what kind of perspective you're supposed to adopt upon things. Um, and that's also did just a, I mean, that's a very familiar skeptical problem that, come, that philosophers are already quite familiar with for, uh, under the guise of moral relativism, right? So all the traditional problems of relativism, if you've got another culture with different values, what are you supposed to do about it? And to the extent that you feel obliged to respect their values, it must be because there's something in your system of values that compels you to respect their values, right? So that just seems to get you back to anthropocentrism, right? So it's, it's a very familiar set of moral philosophical problems that no one has a compelling solution to. All right, so here's what's happened then with what I call traditional environmental ethics. Um, is it, it, it basically left uh, a legacy of problems. Oh, one other thing I forgot to mention is that um, if, if you just go back to like this, um, oh yeah, so th this, um, <coughs> excuse me, this, this trajectory from speciesism to sentientism, to biocentrism, to ecocentrism. You get yourself into a bit of trouble if every time you move to the right, is it on the right? Yeah. Every time, if you move, every time you move to the right, if you deny the values of the people immediately to your left, you wind up with a bit of a problem. Uh, and in particular, you can easily find yourself being accused of ecofascism. Um, so this is what happened with, with Baird Calicott, is that he was a, an, an ecocentrism ethic, ethics guy, but he initially appeared to be denying the value of the stuff to the left. In other words, denying the importance of animal suffering, denying the significance of human welfare. And a lot of the positions he took, so... For someone like that, if you're serious about your ecocentrism and you're a monist about value, then, like, 
do you even care about climate change? Right? Like, is it so obvious that from an ecocentric perspective, you should worry that much about climate change? I mean, climate change is very bad for people, right? So if you had the collapse of agriculture in India because of the failure of the monsoon, right, that would be bad for people. But would it be so bad for nature? Right? That's actually not so obvious. Why? Because agriculture is bad for nature. And there's a very, very long, you know, that I'm sure everyone's familiar with, environmental critique of monoculture and of, you know, the technology that we use in agriculture, etc. So agriculture as practice, but even best practice, agriculture is bad for nature, right? under a certain conception. So you look at the collapse of human agriculture and you think, would that be such a bad thing? Right? Look at the, I mean, suppose half the human population were to die. Would that be such a, I mean, that would be a great thing for nature. That would be bad for people. It wouldn't be obviously so bad for nature. So Calicott, for example, was morally opposed to vegetarianism. The major reason for, being, for him being morally opposed to vegetarianism is that if we were all vegetarians, the human population would increase even more than it has already. In other words, the planet would be able to sustain more human life. And human life is so bad for nature that it would be better if we all keep eating meat because that's going to limit human population. It's a kind of like, so, Malthusian view, right? That says we're more likely to run out of food faster if we keep eating meat, so it would be good to keep on eating meat. And so then people were like, wow, you're a fascist. Um, I mean, people throw that term around more loosely in North America. Um, so the, the problem is saying, every time you expand the circle, then saying the values over here actually are more important than the values over there. So in order to avoid this, um, and this is something that the right brings up often with environmentalists, because like any honest environmentalist is going to say, for example, that, uh, that population control is an important part of our future. If you look at IPCC reports on climate change, and you look at the different scenarios, one of the things that kind of is striking is that what happens... Um, in, on the population front is far more important uh, than what happens on the carbon abatement front. Um, so, right, so population is a huge, huge issue in terms of environmental impact. Um, and no environmentalist is going to seriously say that it would be bad to be you know, reducing human population. Consequentialists get into trouble over it. Right? But I mean, in general, from an ecological perspective, you know, like runaway population growth is really, really bad for nature. Right? So it's very easy to jump on that and say, aha, you, know, you want to kill people in order to improve nature. Right? So, right, so you know, th there's a problem. So how, how, does you, how do you avoid that? Well, the way Calicott avoided it was kind of, I thought, taking the easy route, was he said, oh, no, no, I'm a pluralist. I care about all of these things simultaneously. So I care about ecosystems, but I also care about biomes, and I care about animal welfare, and I care about human welfare. You know, so I'm not saying you could only, you know, we have to balance all these things, all right? Okay, um, well, that kind of pluralism is, is, again, not very helpful. And it gets even more helpful if you say, well, how do you rank these values? You say, oh, they're incommensurable, all right? So I'm a pluralist about values and they're all incommensurable. All right, <laughs> so what do we do? Like, you know, should we, how high should carbon taxes be, right? It's like really, really hard to answer any kind of question then about what environmental policy should be once you adopt this kind of pluralistic view of, of values. So, so 40 years of philosophical debate in environmental ethics, you know, what has it gotten us? It hasn't gotten us very far. Number one, this, this basic distinction between instrumental and intrinsic value already uh, is kind of unhelpful. Uh, why? Because no one can plausibly maintain that intrinsic value should be given lexical priority over instrumental value. Right? In other words, it's always going to be the case that we're going to have to weigh you know, like the intrinsic value that you find in nature versus the instrumental value. So here's you know, a beautiful piece of you know, forest that has intrinsic value but I would like paper to write on, and so I would like to cut down these trees and make paper. Right? So we have a tension between instrumental and intrinsic valuation of the forest. Right? Now, 
The problem is that all of these things have been of gradations, so you can often wind up with really, really important instrumental values and really, really tiny intrinsic value. And uh, no, you know, it's not reasonable to say that no matter how small, the intrinsic value just trumps the instrumental value. And so already by creating these two categories of value and by providing no formula for trading one off against the other, environmental ethics is just kind of making things more complicated. Um, it's not adequate to say, as most philosophers have, these types of value are, in are incommensurable. Um, because, you know, every time you make a policy decision, you're making them commensurable, right? Every time you make a decision. The question is just whether you're doing that consistently or inconsistently. So to say, oh, environmental policy should be made just by looking at intrinsic values would be to assign them lexical priority, and no one can seriously maintain that position. So already, like, that first move is not super helpful. But then the second step, then, becomes even less helpful when they start saying, oh, and not only that, when it comes to intrinsic value, <coughs> uh, we can't agree about what the intrinsic value of nature is. And so sentientists say it's, uh, you know, the ability of a conscious organism to achieve its interests. Uh, and biocentrists say it's some other thing. And ecocentrists say it's some other thing. Right? So there's disagreement uh, with respect to where the intrinsic value is in nature. And those disagreements are especially hard to adjudicate because you're talking about value in nature, like not in us. So how are we supposed to even know what it is, right? If someone comes along and says, oh yeah, that thing there is intrinsically valuable, I'm like, I don't know, it doesn't look intrinsically valuable to me, right? Well, it's not, us, it's not up to us to decide, right? Well, then how do you decide, right? So what happens is that the, you wind up with a whole bunch of different conceptions of what, where the intrinsic value is in nature, and then pluralism with respect to those values, where people say oh, they try to sort of simultaneously endorse all of them. And then I think what's, what's the deepest thing going on is that you've actually got two kinds of skepticism burrowing away in environmental ethics, which are actually generating all these conceptions of value. So on the anthropocentric expanding the circle side, you've got a kind of regress argument that's generating the pluralism. That's why people can't agree, is because they're basically mired in a kind of skepticism. So then you, you turn to the saltationist perspective, and you want to say, no, no, I'm talking about what's really out there. And then you just have a different kind of skepticism, the kind we associate more commonly with moral relativism. Right? So both of the two major approaches right, are basically underlying them. They, they're, they're using skepticism naively to try to defend a philosophical position. Something which, by the way, philosophers often do. Um, so, so, you know, what, what is this? Um, this is a situation that four decades of reflection in environmental ethics um, has created a state of affairs that political philosophers can easily recognize um, using John Rawls's famous phrase, the fact of pluralism. In other words, what, what obtains in the domain of environmental ethics is right, what Rawls called the fact of pluralism, which is that you have a bunch of rival conceptions of the good, none of which are inherently unreasonable. Right? That is, you know, reasonable people looking at the evidence, <coughs> judging the arguments, contemplating the values, could reasonably disagree with one another about where the value lies in nature. And as a result, like deliberation <coughs> over time is unlikely to narrow the range of disagreement. Right, so that's the kind of fact of pluralism. It, it's that nobody's making any obvious mistake. Right, what's, what's developed within this field is a whole bunch of different rival views about value. Right? And it doesn't appear that anybody has the resources it's not like, you know, oh, if we put them all in a room for a weekend and, like, lock the door and said, all right, you know, animal, biocentric, it's just, you know, you get in the room, we're not letting you out until you agree, right? I mean, it's just, you know, you might as well put, like, a, a Christian, a Muslim, and a Buddhist in the room and say, we're not letting you out until you agree, right? Like, they're just not going to agree about this stuff. Um, okay, so 
like this seems like the situation which has developed seems like exactly the kind of situation that liberal political philosophy was designed to respond to. In other words, liberalism arises, and this is just like the Rawlsian story, which I happen to believe, right? Liberalism arises as a response to the fact of pluralism. Right? So there's the familiar story about, about religious disagreement, the wars of religion. Hobbes comes along and says, you know what? Forget about the good. Right? You've been talking about the good for like over a thousand years. You disagree about the good. Right? Nevertheless, right, even though you disagree about the good, there are still certain principles which we can all abide by. Right? We can all benefit from exiting the state of nature and entering civil society. Right? And so Hobbes has a set of laws of nature, which are just recommendations that reason gives to us that are in part a response to the fact that people can't agree about the good. Right? So I actually take the, the, the central idea in the liberal tradition of political philosophy to be an attempt to think normatively about how society should be organized, how we should be governed, without presupposing consensus about some conception of the good. And that's, a, I mean, so it's not an accident that what's happened in the last only 15 years, 20 years, in the last 20 years, is that uh, on the climate change issue, is that environmental ethicists have kind of hit, a, a, not exactly a wall, but they simply haven't had anything helpful to say about the climate change issue. And as a result, like, rather than waiting around for them to figure out what the true nature of the good is, a bunch of people who were basically trained in kind of Rawlsian-style political philosophy started weighing into the debate, saying, all right, well, you guys aren't doing anything with this, and climate change is not going away, so we're going to come in and we're going to try to solve this problem. And what are the tools that we're going to use? We're going to use the standard tools of liberal political philosophy. Right? What, what was called a, like a theory of justice. The core idea is being that of Pareto efficiency and optimality, that of equality, and that of individual rights. Right? I mean, that's like the bare bones normative framework of modern liberalism. Right? So it's not an accident that a lot of these people who weighed in on it, like Simon Caney, for example, was doing like global justice, because that was the big debate in the 90s, he's talking about global justice, and then he's like, oh, now I'm going to do climate change. Right? And it's not like he went off and read a bunch of environmental ethics and then started doing climate change. He just took the stuff he was doing on global justice and said, now I'm going to apply it to climate change. Right? Now, just as a, a footnote, it's actually interesting that this is what's happened actually in every area of, of applied ethics, um, which is that the, the, the strain of applied ethics that came out of the 1960s wound up being kind of dying on its own. Like it, it kind of ran out of steam. And so a bunch of people got impatient and political... So what people, like, instead of studying environmental ethics and bioethics and whatever in the 80s and 90s, you know, people like me were all busy doing political philosophy, studying Habermas and Rawls, right, thinking politically, right? And then a bunch of us got impatient with the applied ethics and said, all right, we're going to take over this field. Um, so, like, my stuff in business ethics is, is the same thing. It's just a political philosopher saying, you know what, stop doing business ethics, right? Forget about Aristotle, like, stop doing ethics, and start thinking politically about the corporation, its role in society, blah, blah, blah. Um, people in bioethics, like my colleague Don Lainsley, exactly the same thing, saying, you know, all of this stuff about autonomy from an ethics perspective is not getting us anywhere. You know, let's, let's read, like, Rawls will tell you more about how to think about bioethics than traditional bioethics. Uh, and, and what happened with, with environmental this was exactly the same. A bunch of pol people trained in political philosophy said, we're going to come in and we're going to start doing this stuff. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so that, that actually, it, it, the, uh, that's, the tr that's the failure of traditional environmental ethics uh, and why it wound up not being helpful in the climate change stuff. And so the first big step <coughs> then is this move towards liberal neutrality. And so I hope to have motivated that in part by pointing to the fact of pluralism because that's ultimately what justifies the attempt to find principles of justice that are neutral it's the fact that the alternative seems to be being mired in disagreement. And the, the archetype of that is, of course, really just disagreement. But if you look at environmental ethics, you can see exactly the same kind of disagreement getting generated endogenously by the philosophical arguments. Right? So again, the argument for liberal neutrality is not a high-powered argument. 
It's just that the alternative is like people disagreeing with each other, right? So let's try to look at principles that people can agree upon despite having deeper disagreements about the nature of the good. All right, so now liberalism is, of course, uh, a complicated tradition in itself. Um, and there are three dominant flavors of liberalism uh, which correspond to the three basic principles that you find in liberal theories of justice. So the three basic principles that you find in liberal theories of justice are efficiency, equality, and liberty. And every liberal theory of justice combines those principles in some way. Although some people claim to be monists, like Ronald Dworkin used to claim he was an equality monist. You could do it just with one principle. But almost every liberal uh, assigns some weight to, one, to all three of those principles. The different flavors of liberalism are largely caused by how, they, how much weight they assign to the different principles, or how they order them, if, if, as the case may be. So the, the first form of liberalism, what I'll call wel welfareism or welfareist liberalism, um, is, is the taken-for-granted position amongst economists, um, but is actually like the least commonly articulated position in the philosophical literature. Uh, and that's the view that assigns Pareto efficiency the, the greatest weight. Now, I find this actually disappointing. I've been a little like, I've been a, 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 a proponent of efficiency for over 20 years now, saying it's kind of an unjustly neglected principle. Because the Pareto efficiency principle is the most obviously neutral principle of all of the liberal principles. In fact, if anything, it, just, it, it, it articulates just the idea of social cooperation. Right? It says that if you can change the state of affairs in such a way as to make at least one person better off without making anyone worse off, then that constitutes an improvement from the standpoint of society. Now, the, without making anyone better off is just kind of to handle indifference, right? What it really means is that if you can achieve a win-win outcome, right, where both people or everyone right, consider themselves better off from their own perspective, right, there's no joint or common perspective that's required, right? Each person judges him or herself to be better off from his or her own perspective, right, that that's better from the standpoint of society, right? So there's the principle of Pareto efficiency, it's the least controversial. It's, in fact, it's part of the reason it gets disregarded by philosophers is that they're always like, oh yeah, Pareto efficiency, of course, Pareto efficiency. Right? That is, it's so uncontroversial that like, we don't even have to talk about it. It's so obvious that a Pareto improvement is better. Not always, but like, sometimes it gets unjustly neglected for that reason. Sometimes it gets unjustly neglected because people think it's merely an instrumental criterion. Um, but it's obviously not instrumental. It's a normative principle. Um, but anyhow, the, the Pareto efficiency was kind of adopted by economists um, and uh, in the 1950s. And so the commitment to Pareto efficiency, that's been kind of the, the favorite principle of, of, uh, of economists since then. Um, and as we'll see, a certain kind of phobia about uh, e econ economics and economists has also been driving a lot of philosophers to, to avoid uh, welfareist forms of liberalism. So the type of liberalism that is currently in the ascendancy within the philosophic discipline uh, is egalitarian liberalism. And so the principle of equality is a kind of natural complement to the principle of efficiency. Uh, efficiency says you should try to make, you know, try to produce win-win transformations. It doesn't say anything at all about how you should distribute the gains of cooperation. So a principle of equality just says, you know, look, if you can, you know, if you can distribute them equally, that's better than if you distribute them unequally. Um, and um, so that, that's the form that sort of captured people's imagination. Um, and uh, I guess I don't have to tell you this, but this is like kind of liberal egalitarianism is like the dominant view in normative political philosophy. Um, and then finally, like libertarianism, I mean that really broadly. That is any kind of view that takes rights to be uh, the most important thing, right? And that's different from equality. Um, so I don't mean just right-wing versions of it, but left-wing versions of it. And not, not even uh, just... Uh, uh, left libertarianism, but like, you know, any view that thinks that rights is the basic normative tool. So in global justice stuff, like a lot of people have like a human rights framework, or think of Philippe Van Parish's stuff, you know, all that's kind of libertarian because, because freedom and rights and autonomy are the core value. Um, okay. Um, 
So I think that welfare liberalism is the obvious and correct way of approaching the problem of climate change. And um, it generates an extremely simple way of analyzing the problem. Number one, it says, greenhouse gas emissions are a negative externality. Right? So as soon as we start talking negative externalities, that's liberalism language. Right? Like if I cut down a tree and my neighbor is upset, right? how, how do you formulate the, the upset? Right? How do you formulate the disagreement? If the problem is that trees are good, and therefore I have destroyed some of the goodness of nature, that's a perfectionist way of articulating the problem. Right? Because I say, like, uh, I say, au contraire, trees are evil, and I want them banished from my yard, right? So, like, we disagree about the good, and then, how, you know, what, what do we do? So, another way of approaching it, so, like, I, I, where I live in Toronto, it's practically impossible to cut down trees. Um, like, I, I had this, like, three-year comedy with uh, the city about cutting down, like, a pine tree that I wanted, I wanted to a walk away. It's a long story. I wanted to cut down a pine tree, okay? And I promised to, like, plant a more beautiful tree, like, three feet to the side of it. Um, and pine trees in Canada are like weeds, right? Like, they grow, like, between the sidewalks. They only take seven years to reach maturity. It's like, it was a pine tree, okay? All right, it took me three years and $4,000 to get rid of the pine tree and to plant a ginkgo two feet to the side of it, okay? Um, so, we have very restrictive bylaws about um, trees. But if you ask people, like, why is it so hard to cut down a tree? They're not going to say, because of the essential goodness of trees. Although probably that's what they think, right? But they'll say, like, trees are the, are the lungs of the city, and they provide ecosystem services that are of value to us all, right? Or trees provide shade, which reduces the need for air conditioning, etc. Right? So in other words, they're always externality arguments. The argument is that the tree generates positive externalities for others, such as purifying the air or casting shade or whatever. Uh, and similarly, if the neighbor wants to complain about the tree, they'll do it in terms of shade or like roots or something like that, right? So it's always in terms of these spillover effects and harms for other people. Those are liberal arguments, right? Okay, so number one then is you say, look, greenhouse gas emissions are a negative externality. Number two, it generates a collective action problem. What does it mean, to, a collective action problem? It means that it's a Pareto inefficient outcome, right? It's inefficient. What that means in practice is that too much fossil fuel is being burned, right? The first barrel of fossil fuel that we burn is no doubt justified because we do actually do very useful things with fossil fuel, right? But the last barrel of fossil fuel that we burn is clearly not justified, right? Because of the presence of a negative environmental externality. Right? So, what should policy do? Policy should correct it such, in such a way that we stop burning fossil fuel at the point at which it's no longer justifiable to burn fossil fuel. Right? Um, so that, that's like the welfare liberal approach to the problem. Um, and Another way of motivating is just to observe that when you talk about carbon abatement, um, carbon abatement, and by the way, so the, for those, I guess people probably know this, but so carbon winds up being like a stand-in for like all greenhouse gases. Um, so there are, there are other greenhouse gases, um, methane, uh, water vapor, and so on. Uh, typically in, in policy debates, all of these get translated into carbon equivalents. It's a bit complicated because some of them are, have a more intense effect but they're less persistent in the atmosphere. Uh, and so there's kind of a nifty little way in which everything can get translated into carbon equivalents. So everything is typically articulated in terms of carbon tons emitted into the atmosphere, although that doesn't literally refer to just a carbon ton. It refers to all equivalents. And secondly, I talk about fossil fuels generically just because hydrocarbon burning is the major source of greenhouse gas emissions, but it's not the only source of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, obviously, direct emission of methane is one, um, but um, it's also important to know that, that pouring concrete uh, is, a, is a major source of greenhouse gas emissions. It's responsible for 5% of the global uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So it's not just fossil fuels, it's other kinds of things as well. Um, so carbon abatement is, is a kind of catch-all term. Fossil fuel is a catch-all term for the activities that generate greenhouse gases. Okay, now, uh, so carbon abatement 
is where we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, carbon abatement is going to produce certain kinds of benefits, um, but the, the marginal benefits declining. Right? So the more of it that we do in terms of abatement, the less benefit that abatement is going to generate. Similarly, <coughs> uh, the more we do carbon abatement, as you all know in Germany, the more costly it becomes to do further carbon abatement. Right? So Canada, where I live, still has a relatively low cost of abatement. Why? Because in many parts of the country, we still burn coal to make electricity. Uh, in a sense, like, um, well, you know, Germany got complicated, right? But anyhow, um, I mean, so France is a good example of a country that has an incredibly high uh, cost of abatement because 75% of their electrical power comes from nuclear, right? So heavily nuclearized countries, for example, have extraordinarily high cost of abatement. Um, whereas countries that are still burning coal have low-hanging fruit, right? Where it's actually pretty cheap to do abatement. Right? Coal is always the easy bad guy. Um, so it just... Just drawing the picture, I don't know, maybe it's just me, right? But just drawing the picture kind of makes you say, boy, like, what is the policy challenge? The policy challenge is doing carbon abatement up until the point where the marginal costs are equal to the marginal benefit. Right? I just feel like if you just looked at that picture for long enough, you would all come to agree with that, okay? Um, Maybe not, but just, um, anyhow, like what else could it be, right? Like what else could you want? Well, that's very much how an economist thinks about the question. Um, <clears throat> many people, however, are very allergic to the economist's formulation of it. And so they have sought to resist it. Um, if you formulate it this way, though, it just looks like an optimization problem. It just looks like your standard sort of economist optimization problem. And so you could use the standard economist toolkit to recommend a policy in this particular domain. Uh, that's actually what I think is correct, but I got all week to convince you of that. Um, but so unfortunately, though, liberal political philosophers, when they first weighed in on this question, uh, resisted this framing of the issue. Uh, and in particular, they tried to kind of avoid worrying about the sort of trade-offs that are implicit uh, in, in the, this picture and the policy that would be recommended. Um, and so there... There were major initiatives undertaken to, to reframe the problem, not as an efficiency slash optimization problem, but either as an egalitarian problem or as a rights problem. Right? So if you go back to my three types of liberalism, I'm saying that climate change is firmly anchored as a welfare liberal problem. Like that's the toolkit that you should use to approach it. Uh, the dominant tendency in the philosophical literature, however, was to resist that and to try to formulate it as either an egalitarian problem or as a problem of climate justice. Whenever you see that phrase, you know that someone's trying to be an egalitarian about climate change, or else as a rights problem. And so what I want to do to, uh, to wrap things up today then is to talk about uh, why both of those uh, were, were dead ends, uh, conceptual dead ends. Um, and, and I'm not saying this like Joe Heath's saying this, the people who are making the arguments have come to realize that they were dead ends. All right, so the first then is this climate justice business, um, the egalitarian liberal approach. It's kind of a big quote here, um, but uh, this is like a typical way of framing the problem. So this is from Stephen van der Heiden, uh, this book, Atmospheric Justice. It, like I said, anything that has justice in the title is gonna be a kind of egalitarian thing. Um, well, he says the following, everybody wants to produce greenhouse gases, but the atmosphere is kind of like a global commons, right? Which is that we're overgrazing the commons. And so there's only so much more that we can put into the atmosphere. And as a result, you wind up with something like Locke's initial appropriation, where we have to decide how to divide up the remaining amount of atmospheric absorptive capacity amongst the different nations of the world. Right? So the problem is really a cutting-the-cake-style division problem of who gets what. Right? So th there's a saying, you know, to the hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, well, to the political philosopher who's accustomed to thinking of everything as a distributive justice problem, climate change comes along and it looks just like a distributive justice problem. Right? So how do we divide it up? So now, And by the way, uh, the debates leading up to the Kyoto Accord, 
So the, the period of international negotiations from Kyoto to Copenhagen reinforced this way of thinking about it. So the Kyoto Doctrine of Common but Differentiated Responsibilities implied that the global community was going to have to agree on a formula for dividing up the burdens of emissions reduction amongst the different nations of the world. And as a result, some principle of distributive justice would have to be applied in order to decide how much carbon abatement the EU would have to do, how much Russia would have to do, how much North America would have to do, et cetera, et cetera. What happened after Copenhagen was people gave up on the idea of ever coming to an agreement about a principle of distributive justice. Right? So post-Copenhagen and then Paris kind of says, well, everybody can decide on their own. Uh, and we're not going to try to have a global agreement about that. So this whole distributive justice way of thinking about it is a little bit passé for young people here. Um, back in the Kyoto period, this was like how, it's not just philosophers were talking about it this way, this is how the international community was talking about it as well, that we really had to come up with a distributive justice formula. Um, and so what philosophers said was, okay, so really this is like just Locke, like we just read Locke's second treatise of government and we can do climate change policy, right? It's how do we divide up property, right? And how much should you get? And then the answer, so instead of property though, what is it that we're dividing up? Well, we're dividing up permits, right? Everybody should get permits, allocation permits, em sorry, emissions permits. So it's an allocation of emissions permits problem. And then you say, well, what's the answer? Well, we're all egalitarians, so there should be equal per capita allocation of emissions permits, right? That was sort of the normative baseline for this discussion. And then what happened was that a bunch of people came along and made a bunch of problems for this view. Philosophers are like really good at making problems, not so good at solving problems. So, so you say, okay, there should be equal per capita permit allocation. Well, immediately, the, well, there's this argument, this was a Kyoto era argument as well. This was kind of like China's argument. China's argument was, you know, you people put the, the greenhouse gases there. As a result, you know, and you people means nations, right? So the rich countries are responsible for the existing stock of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Therefore, you are entitled to fewer emissions permits in the present. Um, so now it's our turn to pollute the atmosphere. You guys had your turn. Uh, and then, of course, the Western countries responded by saying, yeah, but they're, they're all dead, like those people who did all the, like, the polluting. Like, it doesn't help me that my grandfather, like, burned oil like a nut. I mean, like, it, in other words, we're talking about living people here. And so the principle of national, like, community, whatever, you're like, all right. So a big, huge argument develops over historical emissions, huge literature on historical emissions. And then luck egalitarians, right, because everyone's big on luck egalitarianism, comes along and say, oh, well, what about people's circumstances? You know, like it's not your fault that, you know, you're born in a northern country, and as a result, you have to emit more than somebody who lives in a southern country. So Axel Gossery made this argument, right? Therefore, maybe people who live in um, northern countries should get more permits so that we can heat our houses. And then Canadians were all like, yeah, we want more permits. Um, but then people came along and said, well, no, because countries also have different capacities, right? So take Iceland. So Iceland is very northern, but it's also basically sitting on a volcano. And so they have like um, pretty much unlimited geothermal energy. And so it's easy for them to engage in carbon abatement because of all their geothermal. So people in Iceland should get fewer permits. And so, you know, we need to have like a complex formula you know, so the whole luck egalitarian machinery got applied to this, right? And then people came along and said, why are we talking about distributive justice for just atmospheric emissions when there are all kinds of other go goods that are being distributed? And as egalitarians, we're, we're interested in the entire bundle of goods that are being distributed out, not just emissions rights. So Dominic Roser and Christian Seidel said, you know, climate ethics should be addressed in combination with other questions of global intergenerational distributive justice. In particular, questions concerning the distribution of the costs of combating hunger and poverty, questions concerning the distribution and contributions of economic development, distribution of water, food, medicines, technology, seeds, and patents. Like, <laughs> this, is supposed to be a good, this is supposed to be a good thing. Um, th so this is like the left-wing linkage strategy, right? Which is like, you can't just care about this thing. You have to have linkage to like every other debate, right? Um, and so I look at that and I'm like, oh my, like, 
that's a laundry list of unsolvable problems. Right? So, you know, taking climate change and hooking it to these, like, really hard problems doesn't seem like a good strategy for solving climate change, right? So, I, 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 in the popular literature, uh, my fellow Canadian Naomi Klein has like, had the worst example of this uh, in her book, This Changes Everything, which if you read it carefully, what she actually says in it, nobody read it carefully, um, or nobody who liked it read it carefully. Sorry. Um, if you read it carefully, what she actually says is, don't do anything about climate change fix inequality first and climate change will resolve itself. Right? She says the real problem is actually economic inequality. So let's fix that first and then the climate change thing will be solved, right? And I'm like, um, like, like news bulletin, like no one has any idea how to fix economic inequality, um, like fix economic inequality, right? You can, uh, you can affect it at the margins with a little taxation, right? But the idea that you have to fix this incredibly complicated problem that people don't even know what fully causes it before you can solve this, this relatively simple collective action problem strikes me as a, a, just a recipe per, for paralysis. All right, so this whole argument about permit allocation um, became kind of a nightmare because it got super, super complicated because people kept saying, well, what about this? And what about this? And what about that? And then people kept saying, oh, and let's link it to all these other issues, right? No, 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 no. Okay, the thing about it is that it doesn't even matter how you allocate the permits, right? Because any plausible system of permits, right? I mean, so people fixated on permits, right? But permits, like, occur in cap-and-trade systems with trade being the important component. You don't, you don't just cap, you also trade, right? And even the Kyoto system had this clean development mechanism which allowed for trading between nations. Right? So any permit system is necessarily going to allow the buying and selling of permits. And the reason for that is that the marginal cost of abatement varies from country to country and from region by region, not a little bit, but by orders of magnitude. Right? So to get a carbon ton of emissions reduction in France, you could literally get 10 to 20 times more emissions reductions in South Africa or in China or in a bunch of other countries, right? Um, and so you're always going to have trading. But once you have trading, then it just doesn't matter like, who, 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 what permits you give to people from the standpoint of climate change policy. Right? So like people in Iceland have geothermal, great, they can sell their permits, right? People in Canada, where it gets cold, we need to have more permits, great, we just buy more permits. Right? So this whole equal permit, it's not as though these are hard caps, right? So the, the, uh, the best estimate of the global sustainable level of carbon emissions is two carbon tons per person per year. Right? So carbon, current emissions in North America, including Canada, are approximately 20 carbon tons per person per year. Current emissions in India are just slightly over one carbon ton per person per year. But there's no scenario under which you actually get convergence so that people in India are emitting two carbon tons per person and people in North America are reducing our emissions to two carbon tons, right? People in North America are going to be, going to be buying emissions permits from people in India, right? Under any system, like idealized system of global permit trading. Right? And so there's a cash flow between North America and India, but that's not the problem of, 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 that solves climate change, right? That's just like an accounting thing, right? All right, um, so I just want to just put up a little picture here uh, to draw like a really important and simple distinction um, between what is a, an efficiency problem and what is a distributive justice problem. Um, so if you take the status quo as being the point in the middle, right? And this is things that a lot of people know, but I'm going to say it anyhow, okay? So every point to the northeast of that constitutes a Pareto improvement, right? and therefore is a gain in efficiency. So point A is a Pareto improvement. That Pareto improvement clearly raises an issue of distributive justice, right, because it has distributive implications. Player two gains slightly more, right, or the person on the y-axis gains slightly more in that move from the person on the x-axis. So, so every Pareto improvement raises an issue of distributive justice, but it's, that's subsidiary to the efficiency problem. 
right? You're trying to move to a Pareto improvement, and you have to obviously decide a distributive justice question, but it's a subsidiary problem. Whereas if you take a point like B or C, those are issues of distributive justice strictly construed. Right, so say point B, so the straight line there, U, represents the utilitarian indifference curve, right? So those are the set of points north of that curve, or sorry, like higher indifference curves represents gains in aggregate satisfaction. Right? So B is a redistributive move, right? Because X loses and Y gains, right? And the sum total of satisfaction increases. So C is more of a pure redistributive move, right? Uh, where like one person gains, the other person loses. And it's important to distinguish like the, the issue of climate justice from the efficiency problem of climate change. What's happening with this egalitarianism is that people are construing climate change as a harm that is being inflicted upon poor countries by rich countries. And therefore, a solution to the problem of climate change as being like a move to C from the status quo, where one country has to be convinced to stop harming another. And that's going to cost one country and benefit the other. Right? And so that's a fundamentally different way of construing it than thinking of it as an efficiency problem, right? So you have, a, 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 like, climate change represents that, like, solving climate change will make everyone better off. It'll make some people better off than others, and so there are obviously subsidiary distributive justice questions. But that doesn't mean that the problem itself is a distributive justice problem. All right, so, so that's the egalitarian approach. Um, and the reason why it, it, it winds up being unhelpful is as soon as you realize that the permits are being traded, then the equality problem just disappears. The whole who gets what permit problem is just not a problem. Right? It's just an issue of cash flow between countries. And now, this, is, this could be a little bit quicker. Um, you had the, 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 the libertarian or, or rights-based approaches. Uh, so Simon Caney, there aren't many people who've tried this. So Henry Hsu and Simon Caney are the most important uh, defenders of these views, who think that uh, we can think about climate change as the violation of the rights of people in the future. Um, and so um, we'll, we'll articulate a set of human rights, and then these constitute kind of deontic constraints, where you're not allowed to violate people's rights. And then that's going to tell us what to do about climate policy. And so, uh, and again, the motivation for it, uh, in this early article he says, that what's good about a human rights approach is that it rejects the trade-off between burdens and benefits that other approaches endorse. Right? So, you see what I mean? So, like, this is what he likes about the rights framework, is that it allows him to avoid all, that tra all, the, all the talk about trade-offs that's central to the economist's welfare approach. Um, so, here are the rights that he articulates. Uh, there's a right to life, a right to health, and a right to subsistence. Um, so, these are, so this is not Nozickian libertarianism. These are positive social rights. You'll notice also that they're extremely broad rights. Uh, and so it's not difficult to say that doing nothing about climate change is going to violate these rights of people of the future. Someone's going to lose, someone's going to die who otherwise would not have died. Someone will catch a tropical disease that they otherwise would not have caught. Someone's farmland is going to be flooded, and so they'll be deprived of subsistence, right? So climate change violates the rights. Um, and therefore, we get the astonishing conclusion that we must stop emitting greenhouse gases. Right? That's the policy recommendation that comes from this, right? Because we are not allowed to violate people's rights. Therefore, we must stop. <laughs> and it's like, wow, like instantly, um, or whatever, right? So that's a pretty dramatic policy conclusion. Um, there are, however, um, problems with all of these, as I think one could expect. Um, so the first is that the, the strict deontology says you cannot violate rights. Uh, it generates moral gridlock because carbon abatement is also going to violate people's rights. Right? Uh, so anything you do is going to violate the rights, actually of millions of people, right? So for example, like here's uh, infant mortality in China. Right? Um, declining infant mortality is strongly correlated with economic development. Since 1997, when China refused to sign, or to sign on to any carbon uh, emissions restrictions in Kyoto, uh, 
uh, GDP per capita in China has quadrupled since 1997. Right? So per capita GDP in China is four times larger now than it was back in 1997. And what you've seen also is very, very significant reductions in infant mortality. Now, had China agreed, and a lot of that's been caused by reductions of energy poverty, and in particular, the amount of power that China's bringing online daily is staggering, a lot of it is being coal-fired. Right? Like that's the fastest, quickest, and dirtiest way of getting electricity. So suppose China had signed on to an aggressive carbon abatement policy, which had depressed the rate of economic growth. That means that infant mortality would not have declined as quickly as it has. And as a result, babies would have died who otherwise would not have died. Right? So if you take Keynes' first right, the right to life, both carbon abatement and not engaging in carbon abatement uh, results in a violation of at least one person's right to life. And that gridlocks you because it means that both policy options are impermissible. Um, secondly, the rights in question are not Trump's, like they don't actually function like deontic constraints. So if you take that right to health, uh, you're not allowed to impose serious health risks upon other people. Um, we routinely trade off people's liberty rights against the health uh, interests of other people. Right? So as soon as someone gets a dangerous disease, we don't automatically quarantine them, for example. Right? Uh, you know, you could, someone could have the flu right now in this room. Right? That imposes a health risk. Uh, you're allowed to drive cars. I mean, we, you know, we, uh, so the important point is that we're always balancing these rights against other people's rights. In particular, we trade off health rights against people's liberty interests of being able to walk around freely in the street and so on. Right? So the rights in question don't actually function like deontic constraints. Um, and finally, there's the possibility of adaptation. So think of the farmer whose field is going to be flooded and is being deprived of subsistence. Well, that farmer can be compensated in various ways. The farmer could be given a new piece of land. The farmer could be given food. Uh, you could build dikes to protect the farmland, right? In other words, you could let climate change happen, and then you could spend a bunch of resources to, to protect people's subsistence rights. Right? And, and we're already going to be doing that. It's inevitable that we're going to be doing some balance of mitigation and adaptation. So when we talk about not violating people's subsistence rights, we have a choice between doing it through a mitigation strategy or doing it through an adaptation strategy. How do we choose? Again, like the cost-benefit thing kind of imposes itself. Right? The obvious thing to do is to choose the least costly way of, of protecting that person's subsistence rights. But then you need a normative framework for balancing mitigation against adaptation, and the deontological framework can't do that kind of balancing. All it does is it says the subsistence right can't be violated, right? Totally, totally unhelpful when it comes to policy. All right. So you see how the, the rights framework as well um, is, is, is just unhelpful. Like, it doesn't answer the questions that you want answered. Right? And I think a lot of that is just driven by this desire to not formulate the problem the way the economists have formulate the problem. Hence that phobia about trade-offs, right? The thought is that as soon as you, you admit that there are going to be trade-offs in this policy domain, then suddenly you kind of have to hand it over to economists who are then going to tell you what your policy is. So there's this, been this powerful drive amongst liberals to avoid the welfare liberal formulation. Um, so what I've sort of in the second half of, of my talk today has been trying to show that those are also both dead ends. That the strictly egalitarian way of, of, of avoiding the problem doesn't really work because once you admit tradeability, then you're back into the, the optimization problem. And the deontic way of, of resolving it doesn't work either. Because once you admit that the rights are not strict trumps, then you're going to wind up having to balance as well. And I should mention that Simon Keeney tacitly recognizes that, because later on he says, well, I'm a, I'm a Razian about rights, so really all they are is protected interests. Uh, and, then they, and as a result, they can be balanced against each other. So eventually he realizes that his rights are not going to function like, like strict constraints. They're going to be interests involved in balancing. And again, once you start balancing, then you're back in, in the welfare liberal way of formulating things. All right. um,
So look, I kind of gave away the, the uh, conclusion of it all, which is that, uh, I mean, like, okay, so philosophy, I mean, we're not a great discipline for solving real-world problems. Um, so I think, like, Socrates kind of set the model. Uh, Socrates basically caused a lot of problems, more so than he solved them. He kind of specialized in going around and just sort of causing problems for people. That's why they killed him, right? Um, say, what do you think justice is? Oh, it couldn't possibly be that, right? Um, and that still is huge in, 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 our, in, in the discipline. You know, all the famous, I mean, a good way to get famous as a philosopher is to, is to invent some huge problem that nobody can solve, right? So Parfit's non-identity problem, Goodman's problem of induction, like Gettier's epistemology problem, they're always famous problems, right? So like career-wise, you're better off causing problems than solving them in philosophy. Um, and so with climate change, philosophers have had a huge tendency to come along and just cause problems. And it's not because we're bad people, it's just that our discipline rewards that. So environmental ethicists, I would submit, came along and basically just caused a lot of problems. Uh, and then when the liberals came in, they actually also just caused a lot of problems by saying, oh, it's, you know, it can't possibly just be a collective action problem. It must be a distributive justice problem, or it must be a rights issue. All of that just caused problems. Um, so anyhow, so that's my like, brief review of why I think a lot of the literature is unhelpful. Um, so what I'm going to talk about the, uh, tomorrow is the, a more kind of moderate view, uh, which is a sort of sufficientarian view, which also is a kind of way of resisting the seemingly utilitarian way that economists have thought about it. Um, but it's not like a strict egalitarian or deontological view, but it's something that people will recognize. It was Rawls's view that says kind of, well, you know, like we have to help people, future generations, but we don't have like a huge obligation. Uh, and in particular, like economic growth is actually not that important. Uh, so that's a common view amongst philosophers. If you hold that view, then you can't say anything helpful about climate change. Um, in a sense, like, you have to care about economic growth to care about climate change. Eh, that's the wrong way of putting it. Anyhow, hopefully that's what I'll persuade you of uh, tomorrow. Thanks.